and your victory. Cause your power is within me. No giant can defeat me. Cause you hold my hand. You hold my hand. You hold my hand. You hold my hand. Good morning. Thank you for being with us for this time of worship and training. I am Priscilla Brower, an elder at Spout Springs Presbyterian Church. I am delighted to be assisting in this service featuring Dr. Willimon. Welcome. Dr. Willimon, thank you for joining us today. Now let us take time to pray in preparation for the message. This prayer was adapted from one composed by Reverend Chris Denny, formerly of our Presbytery. Let us pray. God, our parent, in each day that you grant us in this earthly life, may the delight of your word dwell in us richly that we may be delighted and be a delight. As we know, in our hearts and live in our life that if we or anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Lord, may that simple phrase echo in our minds. Be delighted and be a delight. May we be delighted to take delight, to find delight in your love, your love for all others. In your grace, your grace for all others. In your acceptance, acceptance of all others. In your transforming each life, transforming all of us to be like Christ. May we be delighted by signs of your peace among us, by daily simple gifts of life by complexity of creation. And may we be a delight to God in our prayers, in our praises, in our generosity of time, ability, money. Be a delight to others in the ways we speak and greet others, in the ways we live, love, and care for our family, in the ways we serve the least of these, in the ways we share God's love with others, especially those who we may think don't deserve it. 
none of us deserve it. That's why it is called grace. Be delighted and be a delight. Lord, I think that is a delightful way to reorient my perspective, my outlook. Gracious God, help me see that what delights you in the world. Help me live out the delight you take in us. May it be so in my life and in the life of the world today and every day. Amen and amen.
We're glad to welcome Reverend Dr. Will Willimon to bring us our message today. Dr. Willimon is a retired bishop in the United Methodist Church who for eight years served the North Alabama Methodist Conference. He is currently professor of the practice of Christian ministry and director of the Doctor of Ministry program at Duke Divinity School. He is former Dean of the Chapel of Duke University and is considered by many as one of America's best known and most influential preachers. Willimon is the author of 70 books, a pulpit and pew research on pastoral leadership survey determined that he was one of the two most frequently read writers by pastors in mainline Protestantism alongside the Roman Catholic writer Henry Nguyen. His books have sold over a million copies. He is also editor at large at the Christian Century. Today, his theme focuses on his short book, Fear of Others, No Fear in Love, which is designed to be used with small groups or Sunday school classes to explore how he might be more welcoming in our churches. His focus text for today's message is entitled, Citizens of Country Without Borders. Drawn upon Romans 15, verses 7 through 13, which I will now read for us. It's the gospel for Jews and Gentiles alike. Welcome one another. Therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God, for I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that we might confirm the promise given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the people praise him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesus shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles in him for the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may bound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. For the word of God among us, for the word of God living in us, for the word of God going out. Thanks be to God. Hello, Coastal Carolina Presbyterians. It's an honor for me uh, to be with you on this day when your Presbytery tackles some important challenges. Uh, now, I'm sure that you Presbyterians uh, don't have the problems that plague us Methodists, but um, my church, maybe I like your church, is beset today by division. My church is more divided than at any time I can remember, said a pastor to me recently. Red, blue, conservative, liberal, evangelical, progressive. Another said, 
I got people who haven't spoken to one another since the last election. Wow. Divisions, cliques, boundaries, borders, walls between Christians, even in the same congregation. Oh, I bet you got people who may call themselves Presbyterian, but their self-identity and the way they build their borders on the basis of a host of other designations. But uh, you got to ask, if, if you know much scripture, uh, you got to ask, when, when was that time when all Christians' congregations were united? together, offering a welcome, open hand to all. Uh, the way I read scripture, Christians, well, as, as early as, say, 50 years after the death and resurrection of Christ, uh, have experienced problems with getting together. In fact, that's why I think Paul wrote these words to First Church Rome. Welcome one another in the same way that Christ has welcomed you. For God's glory, Christ became a servant of you who are members of the people of Israel for the sake of God's truth, to make good on God's promises that the Gentiles could glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, I will confess you among the Gentiles. I'll sing your praises to your name. Rejoice, Gentiles, with his people. Or as Isaiah says, uh, the Gentiles will place their hope in him. In his letter to the Romans, Paul pulls out some of his most powerful theological artillery, praising Christ in his cross and resurrection, lauding the extravagant graciousness of God's salvation offered to all. But now, deep in his letter, Paul uh, finally gets around to what's really bugging him. Welcome one another. Paul moves from subtle theological argument to direct command. Proslambaneste! I figure I can use Greek since all Presbyterian pastors, unlike a simple mediocre Methodist, know Greek. Proslamodeste, welcome, receive, accept, open your heart to one another in the same way that Christ accepted, welcomed, open his heart to you. First Church Rome, for any of its virtues, reading between the lines of Paul's letter, must have had a problem with division, barriers, fences. Proslambaneste, one another, Paul says to them. And, uh, I'll, I'll come on now, be honest. Though there may be lots of things in Paul's letter to the Romans you can't understand, I bet you understand this. Uh, what's the greatest challenge of following Christ? From the first, it's welcoming one another as Christ has welcomed us. Now, <clears throat> I know you Presbyterians don't believe in bishops, but I was one, take my word for it. And uh, as bishop, I never had any of my pastors throw in the towel because of Jesus. I mean, you'd think they would. Oh, Jesus is just too demanding. He raises the bar every week. Oh, Jesus is too tough a boss to work for. No, the reason Methodist preachers call it quits is you, the laity. They love Jesus. They just can't stand to get with his friends. <laughs> when I became bishop in Bama, uh, sometimes folks would ask, what do you miss most about your life in academia as a scholar compared with your present life here as a church bureaucrat? I learned to answer, <clears throat> uh, I miss most the Duke Office of Undergraduate Admissions, 
which through their laborious, expensive vetting process, ensured that I would never encounter anyone on campus who didn't look a whole lot like me. Oh, oh sure, we had our gender race differences, but all of us had been equally successful in working the American educational system to our personal advantage. And it was wonderful. All day, without a serious disagreement or a deadly confrontation, argument. But uh, <clears throat> here in church, <laughs> Jesus won't let us have an admissions committee. There's no screening of baptismal candidates. Church is where you're forced to work with, get money out of, and be disciples with anybody Jesus Christ drags in the door. Come on, you uh, church members, uh, you elders. Uh, I, I bet there's somebody that you pray will be sick at the next meeting of the session or whatever it is you Presbyterians call your governing body. Uh, and Paul, here in his letter to the Romans, reminds us, such has it ever been in the body of Christ. Thus, we have a command. Welcome one another as Christ Jesus has welcomed you. Jesus Christ loves to coerce uh, all kinds of different people into being church with people, many of whom I have little in common with and many whom I probably would not have chosen to be saved if Jesus had let the choosing be up to me. Uh, but that's the way Jesus works. What do you got to show for your years of preaching, teaching, and unimaginable suffering on the cross? God the Father as God the Son as he enters paradise after his resurrection and ascension. And Jesus holds up his great victory trophy. A slightly repentant, uninformed, crucified thief. That's Jesus for you. Uh, imagine the context into which Paul is speaking. Paul is talking to his fellow Jews, God's people who down through the ages had suffered again and again horrible Gentile persecution precisely because they were God's beloved. Jews who had no doubt seen Gentiles persecute or killed members of their own family. And Paul says to his fellow Jews, welcome, accept, receive, open your hearts to these Gentiles. like in those early congregations. Uh, uh, we know why we Jews see that uh, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. He's the fulfillment of the promises of God to Israel. Yeah, yeah. But what are these Gentiles doing here in church? There's no promises to them in the Old Testament. We're to welcome them? Uh Surely this had to be the riskiest, toughest thing these Jewish Christians had ever been asked to do. Welcome Gentiles? Paul here says that such boundaryless welcome is no more difficult and costly than Christ accepting, receiving, opening his heart to you. Oh, it would have been easier to be a Christian if Christ had only commanded us, accept me as your personal Savior. But he went on and also said, accept the other, the stranger, the one you are tempted to regard as alien. Accept that one as your sister, brother, sibling because of me 
and my acceptance of you. And Paul implies here, I think, we cannot be with Christ if we refuse to be with those whom he is with. Jesus Christ invites us. You, children of the covenant, you into a new kingdom unlike this world's realms, a vast circle with a very well-known center, Christ, but with an unknown circumference nobody has ever been able to determine. It, it, <clears throat> it's natural for us to have our borders and our boundaries, our walls, our barriers, my country, uh, my family founded this church. No, 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 not, not, not in my neighborhood. Me, insider, you, outsider. Uh, they're nice people, you know, I've got nothing much. They, they just, they're not, they're just not our type, are they? That is natural. That is typical. I guess every people in every age establishes borders, defends them with murderous intensity, builds walls, locks gates, expends vast sums and many lives to secure these borders. And then along comes God as Jesus Christ, open-handed, welcoming all, kicking in doors, knocking down walls, leaping over our borders, refusing to allow his people to draw lines that separate him from those he died to save. If we had the time, I think I could demonstrate scripturally that Jesus Christ was tortured to death in great part because he saved the wrong people. He Save people that nobody thought could be saved. People for whom nobody wanted saved. Every time we baptize somebody, we ought to, maybe we ought to have the baptized person turn around and look out upon the assembled congregation and ask, now before we make you a child of the covenant, which is what we Presbyterians do, uh, are you sure you're willing to be saved? along with these people? Sure, they might say. This is one of the friendliest congregations I've ever visited. And that's when the, the pastor can say, you really haven't gotten to know us yet, have you? <laughs> and if Paul's proslambaneste, welcome one another, if it was limited to just the saints at First Church Rome, well, as we've said, that that would be a challenge enough. Yeah. But Christ's command to welcome is more demanding even than the people within your congregation. <clears throat> First Bible verse I ever learned by heart. John 3.16 For God so loved uh, me and, and people who look a lot like me, that he gave his only begotten son that knew. God so loved the world. Christ didn't die for the church. He thinks the whole world is his. And he will not rest or let us rest until all are one in him. Matthew 28, resurrected Christ, gathers his disciples and says, okay, uh, here's my one last word before my ascension. I want, want you to write this down. Uh, get some real estate and remember location, location, location and tell the bank you're an Elamosinary group. Uh, that way you'll get a better rate. No. Christ says, hey, don't just cluster around here with the first 12 to show up. Those with whom you are most comfortable, get out of here. Go into all the world and make disciples. And they say, how are we going to do that? 
He says, baptizing everybody, teaching all. You Presbyterians, for God's sake, teach uh, to obey me. And lo, I am with you always. Just to make darn sure you don't wimp out and hunker down here with your family and friends with whom you're most comfortable. I'm going to take back the whole world, he says to us. And guess who's going to do it with me? How? Welcome one another. And you ought to know how to do it because look at the way that, that I overcame your boundaries and I welcomed you. Uh, you'll find, she said to me at the church door after my guest preacher's sermon, You'll find that this is the warmest, friendliest church. Oh, we, we love like a family. If anyone in this congregation is going through a tough time, we're, we've got one another's back. We... And I, remembering Paul's words, thought. I didn't say it, but I, I thought it. Sorry. <laughs> Even that is not good enough for Jesus. He wants it all. At its best, the church has never, has never respected a national border. It's called mission. We've never shunned connecting with people who didn't look or talk like us. It's called evangelism. Here's the sad truth behind Paul's welcome one another. No congregation has a future that honors the labels like European, conservative, liberal, right, left, more than it obeys Christ's command. Welcome one another. As I have dared forgive, save, die for, and welcome you. In a discussion with a group of pastors recently, um, they were lamenting all the divisions in their congregations. Well, there was one sweet pastor who said, well, not in my congregation. Everybody in my congregation is on the same page. There's no blue-red state divide in my congregation. We are unified and harmonious. To which another pastor replied, and I think he was a Presbyterian, um, well, then... You have failed at evangelism, haven't you? If you don't have a congregation full of differences that the Holy Spirit is busy helping you overcome, then that's a commentary on your congregation's attempt to limit the boundaries of Christ's kingdom. Ooh. The test of a faithful congregation is not doctrinal adherence to the Westminster Confession, and I don't care what your preacher just told you. Uh, it's not unity in all matters, or, or how well it serves one age group or one race or one economic stratum. No, the test, the supreme test for a church is to look out on a Sunday morning and see somebody whose presence there cannot be explained any other way than faithfulness to Romans 15, 7. That's the sure sign of your obedience to Jesus' way. When I was a bishop, uh, there were two churches that were uh, fairly close proximity to each other. One was Oak Grove, the other was Pleasant Hill. And they were about the same size, about 50 people worshiping there on a Sunday when I first met them. Well, out at Oak Grove, uh, there was a women's Bible study prayer group that came up with the idea of getting that congregation back in touch with their surrounding community. The community had changed from the community that had formed the church. Well, anyway, uh, after prayer and planning, uh, they began an after-school program 
for latchkey kids that were coming home from school to empty homes. Uh, one of the women had taught Spanish at the local high school, so she was perfect for the job. And three afternoons a week, these women gathered with uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, homework help for the kids who gathered in their churches, once sparsely used fellowship hall. Turns out those kids had parents. We invited them all to come to church and we, we schemed together about what we could do to make our church really welcoming for them. Oak Grove's attendance on Sunday went from 50 to 75 in just six months. Now over at uh, Pleasant Hill Church, one Sunday, one of the members brought her little granddaughter to church with her, and the granddaughter brought one of her little friends, and her friend was of another race than Pleasant Hill's congregation. Well, next Sunday, uh, the little friend showed up <laughs> with her parents. That evening, the grandmother got three or four phone calls saying things like, uh, it's not that we have anything against them coming to our church. It's, it's just that uh, sh surely they would be more comfortable at, a, at another church with people with whom they have much more in common. Uh, not like people like us. The grandmother and her granddaughter never attended Pleasant Hill again. A year later, I presided over the session of our annual conference that closed Pleasant Hill Church. The pastor, on his way to a, a more faithful church, side on his way out and said, you know, Jesus gave us the opportunity to act, uh, to, to show that we really loved him and, and we refused to act toward them like he had acted toward us. I tell you from what I've seen behind every dead or dying church is a group of folks that fail to obey Jesus. This is one of the most challenging life and death words we are given. Proslambaneste, others. As Jesus Christ has proslambaneste you. Amen. The Confession of Belhar is a powerful confession of Christian faith that emerged in South Africa during the years of government-imposed racial segregation known as apartheid. The major themes of the Confession of Belhar are unity is both a gift given by God and an obligation of the Church of Jesus Christ. The Church of Jesus Christ must stand with people who suffer any form of oppression and injustice. Reconciliation and justice of God are central to the life of the Church of Jesus Christ. The Presbyterian Church USA Book of Confessions reminds us that confessions address the issues, problems, dangers, and opportunities of a given historical situation. Many in the Presbyterian Church USA have claimed the Confession of Belhar not only for its courage voiced from a church and people suffering over two centuries of oppression and injustice, but also for the ways it speaks to our 21st century American Presbyterian context that is struggling with division and the ongoing wounds of segregation and racism. We believe the Confession of Belhar speaks to the Presbyterian Church USA. We believe the Confession of Belhar is our confession today. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through word and spirit. This God has done since the beginning of the world 
and will do to the end. We believe in one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints called from the entire human family. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. That unity is therefore both a gift and an obligation for the church of Jesus Christ. That through the working of God's spirit, it is a binding force, yet simultaneously a reality which must be earnestly pursued and sought one which the people of God must continually be built up to attain. That this unity must become visible so that the world may believe that separation, enmity, and hatred between people is sin, which Christ has already conquered. And accordingly, that anything which threatens this unity may have no place in the church and must be resisted. That this unity of the people of God must be manifested and be active in a variety of ways and that we love one another, that we experience, practice, and pursue community with one another. That we are obligated to give ourselves willingly and joyfully to be of benefit and blessing to one another. That we share one faith, have one calling, are of one soul and one mind. Have one God and Father, are filled with one spirit, are baptized with one baptism, eat of one bread and drink of one cup. Confess one name, are obedient to one Lord, work for one cause, and share one hope. Together, come to know the height and the breadth and the depth of the love of Christ. Together, are built up to the stature of Christ, to the new humanity. Together, know and bear one another's burdens thereby fulfilling the law of Christ, that we need one another and upbuild one another, admonishing and comforting one another. That we suffer with one another for the sake of righteousness. Pray together. Together, serve God in this world. And together, fight against all which may threaten or hinder this unity. That this unity can be established only in freedom and not under constraint. That the variety of spiritual gifts, opportunities, backgrounds, convictions, as well as the various languages and cultures are by virtue of the reconciliation of Christ, opportunities for mutual service and enrichment within the one visible people of God. That true faith in Jesus Christ is the only condition for membership Therefore, we reject any doctrine which absolutizes either natural diversity or the sinful separation of people in such a way that this absolutization hinders or breaks the visible and active unity of the church or even leads to the establishment of a separate church formation. Which professes that this spiritual unity is truly being maintained in the bond of peace while believers of the same confession are in effect alienated from one another for the sake of diversity and in despair of reconciliation. Which denies that a refusal earnestly to pursue this visible unity as a priceless gift is sin. Which explicitly or implicitly maintains that dissent or any other human or social factor should be a consideration in determining membership of a church. We believe that God has entrusted the church with the messages of reconciliation in and through Jesus Christ. That the church is called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That the church is called blessed because it is a peacemaker. That the church is a witness both by word and by deed to the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells that God's life-giving word and spirit has conquered the powers of sin and death, therefore also of irreconciliation and hatred, bitterness and enmity. That God's life-giving word and spirit will enable the church to live in a new obedience, which can open new possibilities of life for society and the world. That the credibility of this message is seriously affected and its beneficial work obstructed when it is proclaimed in a land which professes to be Christian 
but in which the enforced separation of people on a racial basis promotes and perpetuates alienation, hatred, and enmity. That any teaching which attempts to legitimate such forced separation by appeal to the gospel and is not prepared to venture on the road of obedience and reconciliation, but rather out of prejudice, fear, selfishness, and unbelief, denies and advance the reconciling power of the gospel, must be considered ideology and false doctrine. Therefore, we reject any doctrine which, in such a situation, sanctions in the name of the gospel or of the will of God, the forced separation of people on the grounds of race and color, and thereby in advance, obstructs and weakens the ministry and experience of reconciliation in Christ. We believe that God has revealed himself as one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people, that God, in a world full of injustice and enmity, is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged that God calls the church to follow him in this, for God brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry, that God frees the prisoner and restores sight to the blind, that God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows, and blocks the path of the ungodly. That for God, pure and undefiled religion is to visit the orphans and the widows in their suffering, that God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right. That the church must therefore stand by people in any form of suffering and need, which implies that, among other things, the church must witness against and strive against any form of injustice so that justice may roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That the church as the possession of God must stand where the Lord stands, namely against injustice and with the wronged. That in following Christ, the church must witness against all the powerful and privileged who selfishly seek their own interests and thus control and harm others. Therefore, we reject any ideology which would legitimate forms of injustice and any doctrine which is unwilling to resist such an ideology in the name of the gospel. We believe that in obedience to Jesus Christ, its only head, the church is called to confess and do all these things, even though the authorities and human laws might forbid them, and punishment and suffering be the consequence. Jesus Christ, yes, to the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory forever and ever.
Pray that we get out our business straight so that we're all gonna meet at the gate. I pray we're all gonna be ready for his return. Man and wife in their bed, one of them by the spirit led. The rapture came and took that one above. The other one rose on the next day to find their loved one had raptured away. Oh, what a way to lose the one you love. And I pray that we children in the mall their mama heard the master's call she was swept into the by and by oh it's so hard to rely on your mama your mama's friends learn how to pray while you still, while you still got time. And I pray that we all, pray we all be ready. Yes, I pray. I pray we all be ready. I pray that we all, pray we all be ready for his return. I pray that we give our hearts a search so that we walk 